All right, we are back to our Lost Minds of Fandelver Dungeon Master walkthrough, and here's a great tip to get started. Sometimes it's better to end a session a little bit early and leave them wanting more. It can be much better than starting the next thing and running long on a work night or a school night or whatever and having your players eyeballing the exits. Describing your players walking down the stone steps to explore below the mysterious ruined manor is a great place to hit pause for the night. The moment they trigger combat encounters is always great as well. Starting a session by saying, hey, roll for initiative always gets the blood pumping. Having people watching the clock instead of the game, not so much. As you can probably tell, that last video was going to be very long, so I split it up. And now the red brand hideout gets its own video. The party are probably going to enter in room one, but there is another entrance. And if the players asked around and spoke to Carp, they know about the secret tunnel into room eight. Secret tunnel. One quick note before we dive into the dungeon. Do not underestimate how useful Carp can be as an NPC, especially if your player characters have not been acting super friendly or heroic in general. They're less likely to be total jerks to a little kid. And even if they've been engaging with everybody, having a kid being like in awe of our player characters can really boost them up and make them feel and act more like heroes. Carp and kids in general are great for that. Maybe have them ask for an autograph or to like hold the sword. Plus any non-player character we can get the players to care about is a huge asset. The players might not be all that motivated to find Wave Echo Cave or the Black Spider until Carp gets snatched up. Don't overdo it or they're going to stop forming connections at all. But once in a while, this is just the thing to light a fire under the PCs. All right, so we're going to prep the Red Brand hideout the same way we prepared for the Kragma hideout in Phandalin. We're going to read through it and take note of any named NPCs and important information. And we're going to get our monster stat blocks together. Now this place has about twice as many key locations as the Kragma hideout, and you see how we're being eased into dungeon mastering here. Very clever design. That's also telling you this will probably take about twice as long to complete, but don't just assume that you can prep, you know, one through six here. A couple secret doors is all that stands between both entrances and glass staff's quarters. You don't need to memorize everything, of course. You can read through it at the table. You can bring the book with you behind the screen. But you want to be refreshing your memory. So use underlining, highlighting, note-taking, repetition, whatever it is. Whatever that helps you feel prepared. For me, I find going back to the map as I read what's going on in each room is a huge part of remembering at least the gist of what's what when I hit the table. So let's pull up the map and go room by room here. Number one. This room can be viewed as a lesson in caution. If the PCs noisily tear this place up, the ruffians in two are going to be alerted. The box text only mentions the door heading into three, but not the door into two. And that's a big oversight. Anytime your players walk into a new room, one of the main things to give them is the roots out. They're going to have to work for that secret door to eight, sure, but the other ones are obvious. DC 10 is easy to beat to locate that secret door, but they have to be close to it. Maybe looking at those barrels on that south wall. It's harder to spot, but if the players find the satchel in the cistern, consider having a letter to Glassstaff in there to identify it. Either from Sildar or some member of the Lord's Alliance asking after Iyarno's progress, or the one from the Black Spider on page 26. Maybe do both so that the players can connect all the dots. Room 2. If the players made a bunch of noise in one but proceed on to three, have these guys give chase. Having the last one standing run for that secret door is a solid way to show the party it's over there. The three dirty scarlet cloaks might not sound like they belong in the treasure section, but clever players can use them to impersonate red brands. It's always good when designing dungeons to consider how players might try to use stealth, deception, some other approach than just kill all the things. It is their job to think of their approach, we've got enough to think about already, and the players outnumber the DM, don't forget, but it is smart to leave room for other avenues besides combat. Number three, here we have a teaching opportunity about traps. The lesson is, look for them. Make that door to four sound interesting and the players will likely head straight for it. Keep in mind, this hallway is 10 feet wide, so the characters can be two across and fall into the pit two at a time. Ask the marching order into three single file, then ask for the doubled ranks as they move through it. You can then treat this as a default and ask the players if they changed it when it is important instead of just asking who is in front every time they change locations. It's good to do this early on in the dungeon and not wait until they're walking into a trap because then it simply becomes a cue to the players that something's up. Room number four. Of course the skeletons are going to animate and attack. You know it, the players know it. That makes it more tense, not less. 
It will also keep it tense when the dead inside the sarcophagi don't attack. Here's another lesson in not just reading out the box text blindly. If we've entered through the double doors, don't finish that description with them. Finish the description with the doors into five and six. In general, the players are gonna pay the most attention to the first and the last thing you describe. So don't have a tremendously long middle and put the threats or features to interact with as the book ends. Room number five, ah, ah, ah. Another couple of classic dungeon features, a locked door and non-hostile NPCs inside this dangerous place. Prisoners are usually a good way to do that and vary up the encounters. It's easy to pick this lock, but hard to brute force it. If everything fails, let your players attack it and damage it enough for the prisoners to squeeze out after a couple good hits. Mirna's quest here doubles down on Thunder Tree. The adventurer wants the party to go there and find that dragon on the cover of the box. Multiple hooks again, you see? Move the necklace if you want the PCs to go somewhere else. Now, prisoners always present a challenge to the players. Should they just let them go, or should they escort them back to safety? The first time out, my players barely let these people go at all. They befriended a goblin at Kragmaw, and later they befriended the Nothic, but for some reason, they just did not trust this poor woman and her children. I think they misinterpreted the pile of clothes of you know from the other prisoners in there. I don't know. These things happen. Plan to be surprised. If your PCs are pretty low on HP and resources, it might be smart to take this family's topside back to town and have a rest. Short rest, nothing changed down here, but long rest, there are a couple extra red brands now investigating their dead friends. The players don't know how many bad guys the book says are down here, so don't be afraid to add in some more. If Myrna and company are sent on their way as the party just pushes forward, I'd let them make it out to safety and maybe we see them back in Fandolin later. Room six, nothing magical here, but we might be looking at weapon upgrades for some of our player characters. I bet they search this room for even better stuff, and if they roll pretty high in perception or investigation, I might give them that secret door back in the hallway. Because we have a bit of a bottleneck here, we need the party to find one of these secret doors to reach that western half of the hideout. At DC 10, they are easy to find, but the players still have to look for them. It is okay if they struggle a little bit here. They've heard about goblins and bugbears, a wizard named Glassstaff, plus maybe even a one-eyed monster, so they know that there is more to this place and will probably start hunting for things that they may have missed. If all else fails or the dice just hate them, Going back to town will get them Carp and his cave entrance into eight, or even someone experienced like Sildar or Darren Edermath can straight up tell the PCs that they've probably missed a secret door somewhere. Room 7 gives us another classic D&D thing that I have mixed feelings about a lot of the time, weird treasure. You can definitely put in the effort to make this interesting, you know, who's carrying 30 beaver pelts and who is going to give us gold for them. Barthin seems like the obvious candidate, and if they visit him, he is sure to ask the party how that search for Gundren's going. See how useful it can be to stack functions on an NPC so the players keep coming back to them. Keep this in mind when you start making your own NPCs and adventures. That hermit outside of town can sell magic potions and send the players on fetch quests to get components for them, and maybe they identify magic items and have knowledge about some nearby dungeon. Plus, woo, she turns out to be a real powerful druid if the PCs cross her, or maybe even a hag. Okay, let's get back to this adventure. Number eight. The Nothic is maybe the best part of this dungeon, and there's a reason all routes lead here. Don't always hide the cool stuff away in the final room behind some secret door. Put it front and center where the players are sure to find it. Also, look at all the cool things we can interact with if we fight here. The crevasse to fall into or shove enemies into, the bridges that might collapse or we could knock them out from under people or they could knock them out from under us. Plenty of like columns and corners to hide behind and take cover behind. If the PCs pull back from room 9 or 10, they could end up fighting in here as well. But keep in mind, they don't have to fight the Nothic. You might be excited to describe a PC's arm withering away as a character reflexively holds it up in the beam of that withering gaze, but this starts off as a social encounter. The Nothic is hidden and it's inside the PC's heads talking to them. Another lesson here, how to give your monsters time to talk. The players don't know why they are making these charisma saves one by one as they are checking out this space, and when they fail, a creepy voice is in their head talking about their darkest secrets, their flaws, their fears. It can be fun to communicate to a single player and have them relay that info to the rest of the group. You can make creative use of whispers or passing notes or text messaging or direct messages if you're playing online. You can use the flaw on the character sheet or pull details from the PC's backstory or just directly ask the player what insight the voice had about them. Eventually they'll spot this thing and I'd show them the picture on page 23 when they do. 
They can see the half-eaten murder victim, but they don't see the treasure unless they actually go down there one way or another. Do they fight this thing or do they make a creepy ally or do they do something else? We don't know, but I'm excited for you to find out. Room number nine, Droop. Here's a lesson. Don't be afraid to really ham it up in order to make a monster too pathetic to kill. And Droop can make a great ally because he can lead the party right to room 11 or through those secret doors into room 12 if they ask about Glass Staff. Mosk is also great. I like him switching which side that decorative eye patch is on as he talks to the party, maybe to get a better look at them. Now, it is tight quarters in here for a fight, and some PCs might actually get stuck out in the hallway. Characters can move through an ally space, but they can't occupy the same space. They can't share a square. The players outnumber you, don't worry. They'll figure it out between them. They might even be level three at this point, and beating three bugbears with all their new abilities is going to feel great, though likely still pretty challenging. I have a short video on bugbears in the five minute monster series that you might enjoy if you wanna spice things up a little bit. Now the ruffians in 10 are drunk and rowdy, so they're not gonna hear anything. Always remember, if your players are outnumbered, they're in real trouble. Speaking of room 10, we've got four drunken enemies doing everything with disadvantage and easily fooled. We're being shown here that sometimes it's all right to throw an easy one at the party. We want to change up the challenge levels as we go. And this is a nice little palate cleanser between the three bugbears and the glass staff finale, maybe. And it's also always good to show the baddies just kind of living their lives. These people aren't sitting around waiting for heroes to come and kill them. They're sitting around a table playing a game with their friends, just like us. Room 11. Go to town describing this wizardy mad scientist laboratory. Inside Arcana, even nature or animal handling can tell the players that this rat is actually a familiar. By the time they figure it out, Iarno has left the building. Books always equal a nice opportunity for a lore dump. Plus, we get news of a magical weapon to find, or whatever else you want to include here. More interesting slash weird treasure. Did this adventure give us an apothecary or alchemist to sell this stuff to? No, the only mention is of one that got buried in volcanic ash years ago, but we can always make one up. Whether they are intentional or oversights, there are often loose ends and blank spots in an adventure that the dungeon master has to fill in or can run with, and playing the game is likely gonna generate more of those. Don't be afraid to add on to published content. That's one of my favorite ways to DM a game. If that feels a little scary or you just don't have time, you can always use Sister G and she's already got information and quests for our heroes. Again, complicated treasure can drive the story, not just add to the number of gold pieces on a character sheet. Room number 12. Glassstaff is probably gonna get away. If the party comes through from 11, he's long gone and the chest is lying empty and the secret door is open, showing his escape route. You can even leave a smoking pipe on the desk or a cartoonishly spinning empty scroll case or something to emphasize he just left. If the PCs give chase, they're probably going to catch up just enough to see him casting Misty Step and dashing out of reach. If they have befriended the Nothic or Droop, or they got smart or lucky, they may have entered the secret back way from Seven. In that case, Glass Staff will try to chat the PCs up, but will certainly use that Staff of Defense to cast Mage Armor on himself and boost that AC up to 16. In a fight, this high intelligence wizard is going to try to take out the biggest threat with hold person first. Sucks for that player if they miss their save, but this is a boss fight. I would have Yarno try to back out through room 11 and make his way to 10 and then 9 to rally the troops, gather reinforcements. He's going to use magic missiles, maybe even upcast to level 2 that first time out, and he's going to be doing shield as his reaction to pump that AC up to a mighty 21. Glass Staff does not have a lot of hit points, so if he does get damaged, he's been saving that last second level spell slot to Misty Step to safety and dash for room one and his bug out bag. If the players do manage to burn him down below half, maybe he's trying to negotiate as well. If they capture him, cool, awesome. But unless that last hit is melee and you come out and ask the player if they go non-lethal, uh, my money's on Glass Staff running away or dying. Now the adventure tells us if he gets away or gets captured and escaped, take note, we might see Glassstaff later on, but then says nothing else. Uh, I think the best place for him to pop back up is beside the Black Spider at the very end. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves here. Whatever way part two played out, the letter from Neznar, the Black Spider, points us back into our main storyline, revealing we were actually there the whole time. And here's the point where we blow this adventure wide open. I'll see you in part three, the spider's web, or as I like to call it, the Fandelver sandbox. Looking forward to it. Until then, have fun, be kind, and I'll see you next time. Thanks. Yeah, I forget the next couple lines, but uh, then it goes. Secret tunnel.